Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the kind introduction. I uh, already realized that maybe for my next talk, I should pick a shorter title <laughs> to make it a little bit easier for you. So cool to have you all here. Um, then let's talk about BERT, I would say. So BERT is a language model that got published around a year ago already. And the goal of BERT in the first phase, which I will call pre-training here, is to learn as much about uh, language in general as possible. So how does that work? How do we learn about language in general? Um, we take uh, an input sentence like the one you can see here. Uh, Berlin is the capital and largest city of Germany. We feed it um, to the model but we randomly mask some of the input words. So in this example, the words is, largest, and of. And we, we then ask the model to predict which words should fill the missing gaps. This training procedure works completely unsupervised. We can generate as much training data as we want from simple raw text. Just take the text mask some words and use the words we mask as um, training objective. Um, unlabeled text, we basically have enough. So BERT was trained on really big corpora, for example, the, the entire dump of uh, Wikipedia, which is quite a bit of text, I would say. And this, this training of objective of masking some words and... Um, let the model predict what words were missing. Um, sounds quite simple, but it was one of the major novelties in the BERT paper. Why? Because when we ask BERT to predict the word largest, it can use the context on the left side of the word as well as the context on the right side of the word to make this prediction. So the, the learning is bidirectional. This is one of the key concepts. Uh, the B in BERT also stands for bidirectional. Uh, previous language models were usually um, trained in a way that they had to predict the next and next and next word of a sentence. And therefore, they only had access to the context on the left. The representation um, that BERT learns using this training procedure uh, appear to, to be really good representations to use um, the pre-trained model for a range of downstream tasks. So, for example, um, once we're done with the pre-training phase, we can move over to the fine-tuning phase and train, for example, a classification model. We would use exactly the same model as before. We only replace the last layer, so BERT does not predict the mask words, but a simple class label. And then uh, we can train uh, on a little bit of uh, labeled data to uh, complete this task. Classification is just one possible use case, so uh, BERT can be used for many different NLP tasks. Another example would be named entity recognition, so we predict a tag for each of the input tokens and thereby find, for example, persons and locations in text. So if we compare this pre-training and fine-tuning phase, pre-training takes up most of the time. So um, we can easily spend a week on, a, on an entire cluster pre-training, but we might need less than one hour on a single GPU uh, to master the fine-tuning. Um, in addition to that, um, many pre-trained models got open source together with the code. So in the beginning, uh, a year ago, there was only an English uh, BERT model, but by now, for example, there's uh, also a multilingual model that can understand, or that at least was trained on 104 different languages. So there's a high chance that, that your language was part of this list. The multilingual BERT BERT even speaks Bavarian. Um, that this transfer in general works from, from pre-training representation to the fine-tuning task has been shown, so BERT achieved really good results on a range of benchmark datasets. 
So how does it work? How do we get from uh, the tokens to the embedding? So here you can see uh, kind of an architecture sketch of birds. So for each token, um, we have an embedding, so a, a vector of uh, float numbers, and these we feed into a sequence of transformer blocks. So each transformer block has a self-attention part and a feed-forward part. And in the smaller version of BERT, we have 12 of these blocks. And in the larger version, uh, we have 24. So layer by layer, we kind of build up a contextualized representation of each input token. I'm not going to go into more detail how exactly the transformer block uh, blocks work, because in this talk today, I mainly want to point your attention to the early stage of the model, so the embedding layer. Um, each of these embeddings you can see here um, consists of three components. So the first component for every word is a word embedding. So there's an embedding representation for the word city and city and in, in other, any other occurrence in the text would get the same word embedding. Then second, there's a position embedding. So city in this input sequence is token number six. And for all other input sequences, token number six would get the same position embeddings. BERT needs position embeddings because it's based on a transformer architecture. So there's no concept of word order uh, incorporated by design. So a recurrent network, for example, would read word by word. Um, that's not how the transformer work, uh, works. The transformer needs these position embeddings to make sense of, of the order. And then uh, there's a third component, which is called segment embedding. That's not so important uh, for us today. But um, basically for tasks where you have multiple inputs, so for example, question answering, you have a question and you have a paragraph. And these two things, question and paragraph, would get different segment embeddings so BERT can distinguish what's the question and what's the paragraph. So up under here, this part uh, may sound familiar to people who maybe read the BERT paper or read related articles, but I feel that uh, less uh, resources actually talk about how to get from the raw text to the tokens in the first place. <laughs> so um, there's two steps. And the first step, we just take the um, sentence like he's going home here and we would split um, by white space and we would separate all the punctuation symbols so you can see how this works here. So this is the easier step and then there's a second step which is word piece tokenization. So for each word we got from the first step um, yeah, we, we, would, we would further split um, these up if needed. So uh, if you look at the he's going home example, again, going was split into two parts. So the verb stem go and uh, the typical English suffix ing. These kind of example sentences, sentences are often used um, to visualize how word piece tokenization works. But I actually feel that this can be a little bit misleading. Because it's important to understand that the tokenizer doesn't know anything about grammar. The only thing it does is it takes a word and it splits uh, the word until uh, we end up with tokens that are all known. Known means they are part of a vocabulary list. And this vocabulary list uh, gets created in a completely data-driven way. So this is nothing language-specific. And doesn't take into account any, um, yeah, any grammatical rules, for example. So the vocabulary list actually gets created before we even pre-train BERT. It gets created based on a big text corpus, which in this case would be the pre-training corpus. And we add the most common words and word pieces to this vocabulary list so that we can tokenize the, the given pre-training uh, corpus with as few tokens as possible. Um, yeah, um, this this list is 
of course limited in, in practice. So for the English bird model, um, we have around 30,000 uh, tokens in that list. For the multilingual model, it's more than 100,000, but still in a multilingual case, this list needs to fit words from over 100 languages. Um, yeah, so what happens to words uh, that are not part of this list, especially if they were not part of the pre-training corpus? Uh, I show you two um, German examples here that got tokenized by the multilingual bird uh, tokenizer. And yeah, the words as a translation are sunlight and recommended, and they get split into completely arbitrary parts. So if you if you look at these examples as, as a native speaker, I would say this doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, and my intuition would be if I see that that it's, it's going to be quite difficult for the model to understand the meaning of such a word if it, if it is chunked into three or even four different pieces. Okay, so that's that's basically how it works. And when I um, dived a little bit deeper into the topic and realized this, uh, these are basically the issues I see with that. So um, the first one I already mentioned, this vocabulary list is fixed, and it's fixed during the pre-training phase. So basically words that are common on, let's say, Wikipedia, made it into this list. And once you fine-tune on your own data, which might have uh, completely um, a different different kind of language, very domain-specific, um, then it's not possible to add these words afterwards. I mean, impossible, of course, is a hard word, but as long as you use, let's say, the, the default implementations that are available online, there's it's not planned that you add words to the vocabulary li later on. Um, in case you use the multilingual um, model, it's also good to know that um, rare languages uh, are underrepresented. Um, yeah, and as we've already seen on the last slide, so if your text contains a lot of other vocabulary words, they get chunked into a lot of uh, word pieces, which increases the overall sequence length, of course. Which brings us to the second point. <laughs> The sequence uh, or the, the, the amount of tokens that bird can process in one go is limited. And it's limited because, as we've seen before, the position embeddings are learned. So if you would download a pre-trained bird model, there's position embeddings for 512 tokens. If you have more than 512 tokens, uh, there's no no embedding and therefore it can't be processed. So if if you wanted to learn dependencies that that spread longer than like over 200, uh, over 512 tokens, um, it's, it's not possible to do. And, um, in combination with the first issue, so if you have a lot of out of vocabulary words and let's say each word gets tokenized into three tokens, uh, two to three, then maybe 512 tokens means you can only look at 200 words at one time. That's maybe not too much. So up until here has been theory. Now, when I realized this, I was uh, wondering if the default um, bird is a good option for for me to use um, for my work. Um, and I was, or I was wondering if it's better to to basically train my own bird from scratch. Uh, I did some experiments on that, and I want to share uh, the findings uh, with you. But uh, first. Um, for you to be able to put that into context, I'm gonna, um, yeah, give you some background, uh, about the data I work with. So, uh, at Omnius, we deal with insurance documents. So, for example, with invoices. Uh, and I'm responsible for extracting information from these, uh, documents. So, in terms of NLP, I'm doing entity recognition. The documents uh, we have are usually in German, and they, of course, contain a lot of domain-specific words, like super-specific article names that were repaired in this invoice. Um, next point is that often we don't even start with the text already, but we start earlier with just a scan. 
So from the image, we have to first run optical character recognition OCR. And this OCR algorithms can, of course, do mix mistakes. So an, an O might be recognized as a zero or an L might be recognized as a one. Um, you can imagine that uh, this is a big problem for the word piece tokenization because if you have a completely unexpected character in the middle of a word, <laughs> then um, the, the resulting word pieces will be way different. Um, then we also have a lot of numeric values. So phone numbers, for example, will be always out of vocabulary. So, um, yeah. Um, and last but not least, if, if we cannot process an entire page in one go, then we need to split it somewhere. And since we have no proper sentence structure, like no normal text, it's hard to know where to split the text. Okay, so basically I tried to compare three different things. Option number one is the easiest. Just download the multilingual model and fine tune it on the invoice data I just described you. The second option uh, I thought about was to uh, set at least the language correct and basically follow the the pre-training um, that was done for the original bird, but just do it for German. So let's say download the, the German Wikipedia, uh, train my own general German model, and then fine tune this on the invoices we have. So comparing option one and two, I would uh, I, I would expect that the German model performs better because the data is um, yeah I mean the the pre-training and fine tuning data is at least a little bit more similar. And then there's option number three. Um, this is a little bit out of competition, I have to admit. So this was my attempt to really start from scratch and um, implement a version of BERT that is really suited for my use case and maybe not that general. Uh, so I uh, tried to train on, on domain data from the beginning. Uh, I gave up on the concept of uh, word piece embeddings and used uh, fast text embeddings uh, instead, which we already do and usually got good results with that. And in order to keep memory and runtime somewhat uh, in hand, I um, reduced the number of layers and the hidden size uh, compared to the original bird model. So... Here's the results. And against my intuition, the German model did not perform better than the multilingual one. So I, I didn't train the German model myself in the end. I was lucky that the people from uh, DeepSet AI here in Berlin uh, were faster and they open sourced their version of BERT. Um, they also published a really interesting article about this free training project uh, and their um, results. So it's really interesting. I put the link here in the footer. Have a look. Um, and they uh, said that they needed around nine days on a TPU to pre-train pre that model. That's, of course, a lot more effort than just, let's say, download the multilingual model. In terms of fine-tuning, there's no difference. Uh, just the memory of the multilingual model is, yeah, it takes up a little bit more memory because it has a larger vocabulary list. Uh, I also had a look at into how many tokens each word gets split on average, and I was a little bit surprised to see that there's not even such a big difference for uh, between English uh, multilingual and German, at least on my data. So maybe there were just too many phone numbers and prices that get tokenized, kind of language independent, probably. And then in the last column, you can see the attempt to to implement my custom model. Uh, the performance is worse, um, but it's also nice to see that it's not that far off. Um, I spent more or less one and a half days of pre-training uh, on a single GPU. And for fine-tuning, it took a bit longer, actually, to con to converge uh, to a good performance. Uh, yeah, that was more or less an hour. But yeah, I could really reduce the, the GPU memory uh, compared to the original size bird model. And since I used fast text uh, embeddings instead of the word piece embeddings, um, each word was directly taken as a token, not further uh, tokenized. Ah, yeah, just uh, to to give you, I mean, these were the results on my data. Uh, DeepSet also did the, um, 
experiments on multiple uh, downstream tasks, and they concluded that in four out of five cases, the German model was actually better than the multilingual model. So here's my final slide for you to reflect. <laughs> Should you train your own bird model? If you ask me, <laughs> I would rather say no. <laughs> okay, that's basically it. Thanks for listening. We have time for questions. Hi, excellent presentation. Uh, I have a doubt. Does BERT process and understand languages that's written from right to left, like Hebrew, Arabic and stuff? Or is it only for languages that's applicable from left to right? I mean, since BERT basically doesn't read the text in order, like a recurrent network, but all text at the same time, and then the, the um, attention scores determine how much the words influence each other. I think it shouldn't matter if the text is right to left. Since you also mentioned it's bidirectional. Yes. So it should not be a problem. Good. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, one qu quick question. Uh, what was your baseline? Uh, you compare BERT, but it, did you have another model that you tried before uh, uh, for for the task that you show? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so if you look at these results, um, training uh, like a kind of also standard by LSTM architecture uh, was giving me 76 percent of F1 score, so yeah. Uh, do you know what's the language split in the multilingual uh, model um, the from BERT? So for example, like, are they mostly in the European languages? And if so, what percentage and what other language families are in that language model? Okay, so it's not only European languages, so there's also there's also Chinese, there's also Japanese, there's also I don't know, but basically the way they selected the, the languages was by taking the hundred four biggest Wikipedias. So um every every language that has kind of a lot of articles on Wikipedia was included. If you Google for that list, there's also there's also a list of all languages that, that were included there. Uh, another follow-up question. Have you tried um, making your own custom BERT model, which is not an Indo-European language? No, <laughs> because, um, yeah, I mean, as I, as I said, like at work, I mainly deal with German documents. So until now, I, I never had the chance to, to uh, work on, on other languages. Yes, Hi, thanks for the really nice talk. So uh, you mentioned one drawback here about the sequence length, which uh, which was around 512 sub tokens. I mean, if mm -hmm. if it's right. So did you not run into this problem considering its insurance documents? And assuming we run into those problems, which we are, how did you like? How do you propose to go about it? Okay, so what I did in this this case was kind of this the simplest and and most stupid uh, option to just feed 512 token and then do a cut and feed the next. Um, this is probably not, not the best option. So I guess what you could also do is kind of have a sliding window and then always use the prediction uh, for that sliding window that had the most context forward. This you could do, but yeah. I mean, one thing I did was just uh, implement my own version, and there you can increase the sequence length, of course. It's just like, if you use the pre-trained model, then this is what you get. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, the step before, uh, so, so these scores are for uh, the uh, uh, the uh, insurance documents, correct? Mm -hmm. exactly. And so before that, you actually read scans with an OCR model? Yes. Um, what was the underlying form of the OCR model? Like, how much did you actually lose? Because I, I imagine you can't get 100% here if the OCR model is actually... You mean if you already have mistakes on the OCR? Yeah. Um, 
I didn't evaluate the Oceanus text. So basically, I um, I fed the text as is. So if there are mistakes, there are mistakes. And then I checked if the model picks up these words anyway. So yeah, I didn't I didn't compute um, the percentage of like OCR errors in the text. Thanks. Uh, hello, Marianne. Well, my name is Mariano, and <laughs> yes, um, nice presentation. I really liked it. Um, I was wondering. So, in your experience, um, when doing well, I'm not. I didn't get what was the task you were trying to achieve in the in this experiment. Yes. Um, but uh, by looking at, did did you had the chance to look at the errors you were having, like your machine? I don't know. If you were F1, I imagine false positives, false negatives. What were the kind of errors Bert was doing the most in all cases? Just if you had the chance, at least. Yeah. Okay, so so for part number one, the task I was doing is named entity recognition. So for each word, I would predict a tag, uh, which then results in extracted entities. So for the invoices, I extracted names, for example, addresses, the total price, everything you can imagine that is on there. Um, I I didn't have a chance uh, or, or much of a chance yet to look at the predictions. Um, you're right, that would be interesting. Um, but I'm afraid I cannot tell you too much uh, about that at that stage. Um, can it be that uh, your fast text embeddings actually filtered out your domain specific language? Because fast test text embeddings were done again on some general German language, I guess. And since you had your domain specific language that didn't occur there, could it be that it got filtered out? Ah, so, uh, oops. Uh, good question, actually. So, uh, by fastex embeddings, I mean that I trained my own fastex embeddings on my domain data. Okay. So I didn't use any, um, any pre-trained, uh, general fastex embeddings. Yeah. So they contained, uh, domain knowledge. And, um, how did you deal with the numbers? Did you filter them out or did you somehow transform them? So uh, that's that's a really good question. So if if anyone is dealing with numbers and wondering how to embed them, I want to talk to you. So um, for now, I just kept the numbers as is. This is probably not the best option. I've seen what people also often do is just replace each number with a zero. So you only end up with the pattern kind of. But then how you distinguish between the date and the invoice number, like the format in zeros might be the same. So... Uh, for this experiment, I just kept the numbers as is without any modification. Do we have any people in the room who are working with numbers? Please. <laughs> <laughs> so we have time for two more questions. Uh, hi. Uh, so I was wondering uh, if you also tried for, uh, I mean, you uh, did your tra custom training from scratch, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe like one option that could work would be further pre-training, yeah, like multilingual or German bird on your custom data set and then fine-tuning. Yeah, that would yeah, be an option. Yeah, you, can, you consider it, I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I didn't do it actually. Um, but yeah, I've heard about this option. Well, uh, what, what basically kept me from doing it was that the issues I explained, so the fixed vocabulary and the fixed sequence lengths don't get solved by that. So, I mean, of course, like you, you can, um, incorporate some domain knowledge into the, into the language model, but it doesn't update your vocabulary list and it doesn't add more <laughs> positions than you already have. But yeah, that's, that's a good, um, good point. Um, that's a good thing to try if you want to try out Bert. Okay. Last question over here. Um, first of all, I think that your custom bird, um, does pretty well, considering that it's a smaller, um, model with three gigabytes instead of uh, nine gigabytes. And what was it? 1.5 days training time. 
So I think that's that's a very good uh, result actually. Um, maybe you mix some hyperparameters, um, for example, um, using fast text embeddings instead of word piece tokenization. And I would think, or maybe what's what's uh, your uh, um, how do you see it? Um, word piece tokenization could actually handle EOC OCR errors better than fast text embeddings. Don't you think that's the case? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, this was more of a practical consideration also, because with the fast text embedding for each word, I get one embedding. It's not that I split the word into four parts and then getting a, get an embedding for each. So the, the choice of fast text was mainly uh, also a practical one. Um, if this is better compared to the word piece um, embedding, I'm yeah. As I said, I'm I'm not so sure. Um, but it would be be interesting to find out. I'm just afraid it gets like split into too many pieces if if the the words contain mistakes and therefore are not in the in the vocabulary anymore. Yeah. So thank you for your question uh, for your questions and let's thank Marianne again for her wonderful talk. Thank you.